Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Every Arkansan Podcast. I'm Drew Davis, and this week we're going to mix it up a little bit. I got the opportunity to sit down with Tamrat and Lulu, and Tamrat was the former Prime Minister of Ethiopia, and they have got a story that just knocks any Netflix original off the books here. Here was a city boy, and then he met a young girl who lived in the country, both of them really didn't have much, and both of them had this passion for the country of Ethiopia. They had this passion to see the people rise up, to see the people take control of their own country. And they actually became freedom fighters. And they fell in love in the mountains in this time where it was illegal to actually even fall in love. But they were passionate about seeing the people of Ethiopia step up into something greater. And they chose a path of communism which when you hear the rest of their story, it's amazing because their passion and what God inspired them to do was to help the people become all they could be. But all they knew was this communistic manifesto and they chased it. They became freedom fighters. They led a rebellion that at the end overthrew the entire government of Ethiopia. And that's when he became prime minister and his best friend became the president and his other friend, the defense minister. And they finally reached that point where they thought, we've accomplished everything, but it was in their own power. And when there's power, there's fear. And his friends turned against him and they threw him into prison. And that's where I want you to jump into this story. And we hope it inspires you because when God's at the center, everything changes. I was angry and um, the most painful thing that made angry at that time was the betrayal of my own best friend. I mean the president who threw me to jail, who conspired against me and threw me to jail is, was my best friend for many years. More than 10 years we were together in the political organization, in the armed struggle. We were those guerrilla fighters who were so close. Uh, uh, that every time we talk, plans, strategies, and all these things, we were like brothers. Uh, and we, we get over thousands, tens of thousands of our friends, you know, dead there, get their life. Mm -hmm. And we had that responsibility together to go ahead and so on. So, but at last, simply because of his own personal ambitious interest, not for any other thing, but for own, his own personal interest, personal ambition for power, because he was afraid that I would become the next president, and because we had some political differences later on. Just because of that, he betrayed me. So I was felt that like stabbed you know, by my own friend at the back. That was the most, you know, uh, thing that gets me angry. Even more than the physical imprisonment there. That hurt me very much. And the other thing I was hurt very much while I was in prison was my family. We had two children, only four and one month old when I was in prison. And I had my wife who was, were together starting from the mountain and suddenly were fallen apart. And I was not allowed even to visit them. They were not allowed to visit me. I was not allowed to write letters for them, uh, not allowed to talk everything, anything. And um, that really hurt me. Sometimes while I was in prison, sleeping even, um, I, I was, I used to cry, um, a kind of, a kind of um, cry that, that gets my gut out. Because I miss my children, I miss my family, and I, I remember how we get apart because of him and so on. And, and I just weep and weep and sob and sob 
uh, the whole night sometimes. And that was very hard for me. These two things were, were, were very hard for me. The betrayal and the fact that I missed my family. Tamrat and, and Mulu's story, it starts off in one place and then they reach this peak. He's the prime minister of an entire country. They're living in a mansion. They've got servants. He's at the top and his best friend betrays him and throws him into prison. And he's actually in solitary confinement. He's kidnapped and thrown into prison. His wife doesn't know where he is. None of that. And in prison, in solitary confinement and in abuse and torture and all of these things, he doesn't even know what's going on with his wife. And the cool thing is God's story, it works in tandem here. So Mulu fears for her life. She escapes to Kenya and she arrives in a refugee camp. And at this point in time, he's got a one month old child and a four year old child. He's in prison. She's in a refugee camp and God's working on tandem on both of them. He has this miraculous encounter with Jesus in prison because a nurse who was taking care of him, one of the only three people that was allowed to even talk to him, gave him a track about Jesus and Jesus appeared to him in a dream. And at the same time, Mulu, who has no contact and doesn't even know if her husband's alive, is in a refugee camp and she experiences a dream about Jesus. And both of them come to know that this passion in this heart for the people of Ethiopia was all from Jesus in the beginning. They have just a dramatic turnaround, but it doesn't just improve, it stays the same. They, she lives in the refugee camp for a while. He is in prison. She escapes the refugee camp and gets to be an American citizen. He's still in prison. For 12 years, he's tortured, he's abused, and he lives a life in prison apart with only the hope of Jesus to keep him going. And she is here in America working as a housekeeper, nowhere near the level of, of royalty she experienced back then, raising two young children, not knowing really where her husband is or if she'll ever see him again. Yeah, and then after uh, five years of looking for hope and uh, trying to see if there is something that gives hope, then this nurse came to me and she gave me uh, a tract, a piece of paper. And uh, I started reading that paper and uh, it has a cross on it and three things written. And the first thing is bold letters says, Jesus loves you. And I had no idea how he loves me. And for that matter, I don't know about this Jesus, so it didn't give me sense. Then the second one says, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life from John 14, 6. And uh, the third one says, that also doesn't give me that much. The third one says, Jesus is the only one who can give you a new life. That gave me a little bit of sense because I was looking for a life there and hopeful life. And I was wondering, I started being wondering how this Jesus gives a new life. So that triggered my mind to start asking myself, who is this Jesus? How does he give a new life uh, the whole day? Um, and then after that, um, Jesus, it, it became a reason for, for Jesus to come to me. And do you mind sharing, sharing just that experience when Jesus came to you? Um, after contemplating and thinking about that paper the whole day, at the end of the day, I found myself on my knees suddenly, involuntarily, I can say, and stretch my hands like this and then read that tract and, and start saying, okay, you, your name Jesus here as it's written, as it says here, I don't know who you are, but it says that you give a new life then that's what I'm looking for. And uh, if that is real, oh, why don't you show me? That was, that was what I was saying. So I say that continually for several hours, uh, as if asking him, challenging to come. <laughs> Nothing happened in disappointment. I went to my bed and in the middle of the night, suddenly again, I woke up 
when I woke up, the room was filled with light, uh, very brilliant light. And within that light, there were these small bubbles of uh, light with different colors, a lot of colors moving in the, in the, in the room. And uh, that was strange for me. Um, sometimes I, I was thinking I was hallucinating or something, dreaming, but not. So that was real. So I changed my position. I got up and I hung down my leg on, you know, at the edge of my bed and right straight uh, of me, there is a wall. And at the center of the wall, there was this drop of light. And that light started expanding, coming as if coming to me and expanding like a movie screen. And on the, at the center of that screen, there was this figure, uh, top to bottom, uh, a figure looked like a person standing by. Uh, no details in the faces, but just a figure made, uh, made of light. And then uh, after a while, uh, an audible voice came. And that voice was like coming from, not from that figure only, but from the whole room uh, around. And uh, a very powerful, but very gentle kind of voice. It's, it says, I am Jesus. Believe in me and follow me. If you believe in me and follow me, I am the only one who can give you the new life that you are looking for. That was it. Then everything went by, one by one. And I found myself on the floor. I had no idea how, but I was there, shivering my whole body and sweating and, and crying too, for, certain, for many hours after that, until the morning comes. And it's only on the morning, uh, I said, am I sick or going crazy or am I, have I been dreaming or hallucinating? What is it? So, but uh, after a while, um, I did the same thing as I was doing the previous day on my knees, stretching my hands and saying the same thing. But now what I was saying that, okay, if you are real, and serious, why don't you come back and show me once more? That was what I was saying, for almost for all day. Then the next night, sure enough, he came back and he repeated the whole thing. And then he told me two more things. He said, uh, uh, I will get you out of this place and I will send you to the world and testify of me. And the other thing was, he said, uh, don't be afraid, I am always with you. So that happened, the, the third night he came back again and he repeated the whole thing. Then after that, I said, oh, this must be a real thing. So I have no idea how to get life through this thing called Jesus. But then I said, why don't I try? Just try. I, I don't lose anything. So I wrote a letter, a small piece of letter to that nurse who brought me the first truck. And I told her a little bit about what happened and I asked her to bring me some kind of literature, something to read, so that I would know more about this Jesus. So that's why I, for the first time she brought me the Bible and that was it, my first Bible. Small pocket size, Gideon translation, uh, plastic covers, both all the NHS. And then I went through that. And time, a certain amount of time passes and one of your guards actually sneaks you a cell phone. Yes. And a phone number. He sneaks a cell phone and a phone number and he told me, I give you 30 minutes and this number is your wife's number, Mulu's number in Kenya. He said, I got this number from your sister out there and uh, call her and just talk to her. So I was not allowed for any kind of cell phones. So he said, I'll come back for after 30 minutes and take it. And he said, it's between you and me. <laughs> <laughs> so I called Mulu, she picked up and I started telling her the whole story, what happened to me, praying at the same time in my heart so that she would also accept and know this Jesus because I know she, she was a communist. Uh, but I had no idea what happened after that. 
So then when I finished, she asked me, when did that happen? <laughs> so when I told her the days, those three days, she said, uh, well, Jesus was also with me exactly on those days, in a different way than on those days. So tell, tell us what happened to you. Um, in the camp, means in Nairobi, in the refugee camp. Uh, I was mad, angry, just talking to myself. Uh, no prayers, there's no, there's no God in my life. Uh, in the compound, there, are, um, there were Christians in the compound. They were praying for me, but I was always lonely, just by myself, and with my tears. Um, I didn't have time to hear about God, about the gospel, really. I was still communist uh, and mad with everything what happened uh, in my life and uh, Tamra's life. I was sad, really. Uh, I don't know what happened, really. I didn't pray. They were praying, I know. Somebody's praying for me. Um, this the Lord came uh, at night. One night, uh, he showed up uh, as a light. Just I saw a big light. The second day, just a short dream. Uh, the third day, it's a word. I heard him in my language. His father's voice. His words. In Amharic, he told me to get up and to go to go one of uh, the ladies she was in the compound. She was a believer. He told me to go to that lady and to pray with her. What's a prayer? <laughs> <laughs> and at that time, just I was sure something is going on in my life, spiritually. The light, the, the, the first day, that was, that was scary. I saw the lights at night. Uh, and it was something crazy around my bed. Just the Lord did something. Because I was praying for help because I had a sickness at that time. Asthma and sinus uh, at the same time. And I was praying for help with my dressing in my bed. And the Lord came and helped me with that. And that was crazy. When I wake up, he did something. And with the light, I remember the light in the morning. And that was scary. Really, that was scary. I started, what's going on here? And I saw the dream. The third day, he spoke to me with words to pray with, we call her Mama Sa. She is from Congo. And I, I went to her and I told her what happened. And she was, she started just praising the Lord. Praise the Lord tomorrow. Praise the Lord. Mama Sarah, what, what's going on? <laughs> she said, Mulu, the Lord wants you to know him. Let's pray. Just we start praying. She prayed for me. Uh, just, I don't know what happened. Just the power just came and just I started crying with love, really. Uh, after that, I started praying and reading the Bible. After that, I follow him and I, I love him. <laughs> so what was it like when he called you and he broke that news to you? Was it, were you a little in shock? Yes. <laughs> uh, hearing about God just from Tamra, it was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Tamrat is telling me about God. He's testifying about Jesus. That was a shock. That was, that was an, an amazing. Really. I was amazed. I was amazed. Yeah. Because when we were in the mountains all the time, I was one of the teachers for our guerrilla fighters not to believe in anything supernatural. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know he's alive. You know you each have Jesus. This is new hope yeah. yes. That, yes. that you both have. What, what were kind of the next steps with you? Because I know you, you got out of the refugee camp. 
in Kenya, this United Nation, the UNHCR means the, the refugee, uh, what do you call? Organization. Organization. Mm. They start just processing our, our case after three years. We stayed three years of hard life, really. And with the uh, American embassy in, in Nairobi. And they approved us uh, to come to the United States. And they chose for us just to come to Colorado. They processed everything, the flight, uh, and they find uh, a sponsorship uh, from Denver. Our sponsors was, uh, were um, Lutheran Family Service. And we came in 2003. We started living in Denver, and my children start going to school. I start uh, working as, as a single mom and start living American life. <laughs> <laughs> While towards the end of his sentence, they actually were able to communicate via a borrowed cell phone that they weren't supposed to have to know what was going on in each other's lives and, and this shared hope in Jesus. And Tamarat's life was so transformed by the power of Jesus. What was once hate and a desire for revenge was turned into passion because he wanted his best friend who is still president to forgive him and to know Jesus. So when Tamarat was finally released, he didn't run to America with his family. He stayed there in Ethiopia and got a meeting with his best friend and he told his best friend he forgave him and that Jesus loved him and told him about his life change because of that time in prison and then and only then did he feel released to reunite with his family he flew from Ethiopia to the United States his family was living in Denver when he told me the story he told me that they met at the Denver airport. And for his two kids, he really didn't know them because they were so young. And it was this beautiful thing. He said, they didn't sleep for like two days. They just cried and shared stories and caught up on each other's lives. And the hope that they now have in Jesus for the transformation of Ethiopia. Um, and then several years later, you get released. Yes. And and one of the things that you shared with me the most was um, what God laid on your heart after you got that freedom about your anger. Do you mind just sharing that again? Yeah. Um, after he met me, Jesus met me in prison. One of the things he was challenging me every day, almost every day, every time, uh, was to forgive that president whom who was my former friend who put me to jail. And I was struggling against that idea. No, I don't, I don't, I don't forgive him, I was saying that. It took me a while, actually, about one, a year and a half or two, even after I met Jesus, to forgive him. And it was very painful when I forgive him. I remember it was in the middle of the night I was praying. It took me the whole night, struggle, fight against Jesus. Uh, but finally I, I broke up and I said, okay, Lord, but I want to do that, but I can't do it alone by myself. So help me. I started praying, help me. So I, for my own surprise, after some time, we, I mean, it was very difficult and painful with tears and, and sobs and so on. But then um, for my own surprise, I started, after some time, I started even praying for them for my former friend, the president, and also for his accomplices. And uh, after that, I was praying every day. So when I get released, uh, what happened is I went to the president's office uh, through a process, and uh, God helped me, opened his door for me to get in and, and meet him. And, um, I went to his office, we were alone after 12 years. I quickly went and hugged him and I said, I told him, I forgive you. I forgive you for what happened. 
and for what you did on me and on my life. But I also want your forgiveness, uh, you to forgive me because all those years until I forgive you, I was always thinking of killing you, taking revenge. So I shouldn't do that. So uh, we had an hour and a half or two together in his office, uh, sat you know, on his chairs, and I told him about Jesus, how my life uh, was transformed, uh, and all those things. And then you get on an airplane and come to Denver. Came to Denver, <laughs> and there they were, Mulu and our two children. At that time, they were 16 and 14. Or 12, uh, they were there at the airport, Denver airport. Um, I met them and they saw me for the first time and uh, it was a very emotional moment for the four of us. Um, hugging, sobbing, weeping, joy, uh, <laughs> I mean, after 12 years, they got their dad. I mean, this, these children, they were, so to say, orphans for 12 years. They were without, without their father. Uh, they had no idea whether even they are going to meet him or not. So it was a, it was a very good time, emotional time. And uh, we went back home together. And that night was a very long night, joyful night of reporting. <laughs> 12 years report, one after another. <laughs> did you ever think that moment was going to come, that you'd be reunited, or did you? No, not really. It was, it was, it was a miracle, really. Just seeing him uh, again, uh, meeting him in Denver. Um, just to see him with his children again, to become one family again, it's, it's a miracle, really. I was praying about it. I was wishing just to see my kids with their dad playing, laughing, because they missed uh, many years. For 12 years they didn't see him. They didn't get a chance to play with their dad and to have a quality time with their dad. That was sad, really. For my kids, I was sad. Uh, to see them, just laughing with them. Um, to see him in our house, sometimes it's, it's scary. It just, it's hard to believe, really. It's hard to believe. Sometimes, are you here? <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah. What started out with this passion for the people of Ethiopia and better lives for them, they sought out a solution which was communism. But during this 12-year gap, they realized it was Jesus Christ was the only person that could change that country. They went back to a country where they didn't know that they were going to be welcome or that they were safe with the love of Jesus. And they opened up a ministry that's not only just an orphanage taking care of these children, but it's reuniting children with families that they've been separated finding a job for that parent, teaching job skills training, teaching classes that help unify and build those families so that they don't need support for the rest of their lives. And at the same time, showing them the transformational love of Jesus and how it can change a country one family at a time. As we told you, just our background, uh, being a freedom fighter, uh, staying as a refugee in Kenya for three years, raising my kids by myself for, for 12 years, uh, being a single mom for 12 years, working uh, everything I can uh, for minimum wage to raise my kids. Um, I know life means hard life. Uh, I know how to raise uh, children without enough money. I know how hard it is. I know uh, the children, uh, when they suffer uh, because they missed their dad. Uh, I know those all things. And because of my, li my life, because of my struggle, 
I feel the pain of the widow. I feel the pain, the struggle of the orphan. Those hardships uh, gave me a good heart for the poor. Those uh, painful years uh, gave me to have a compassion for, for a widow, for an orphan. Um, God brought a ministry from my pain, from my struggle, from, from my family hardship. And that's beautiful. Pain, hardship is not good. <laughs> but uh, you get a lot of lesson from it. It makes you grow. It will give you a, a big heart, a new heart. It, transform, it transforms you. God used that those painful uh, movements just to give me that heart because of uh, our life because of my hardship i think uh, it started just uh, to give me uh, a ministry to give me something just to do uh, and to help someone to help the orphan to help the widows i know i don't have much but god's gift God is big. He has every, everything. I am willing to serve. I have my heart. I have my compassion. Really, God, God gave me. And because of that, just we, we created a life center uh, to, to work that, that the, the charity work. And we started in Ethiopia. Now we are doing it. We are helping the orphans and the widows. Uh, we have uh, life center organization here in U in US to help us to uh, what do you call to organize donation uh, those those kind of things yeah just from my life I think uh, we started to establish a life center means a charity organization and and one of the things that we kind of discussed earlier is Y'all are helping in a unique way. It's not just an orphan in the way a lot of us kind of characterize. It's mm -hmm. yeah. uh, orphans that are being raised by an aunt or an uncle or an extended family yes. member or, or some other kind of thing. Yes. You're helping both. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. School, mm -hmm. clothing, yes. food, those, those things. Water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you're also helping economically. Yes. It, it's not just, okay, let's get you graduated from school. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little bit more about that side of it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we work uh, with, with the orphans and with, with the widows. Uh, for, for the widows, we give them uh, a loan, interest-free loan, to start a small business. That means to help them to, to, to sustain themselves. Uh, through time, the purpose is through, through time, those widows just to be able to stand themselves, to have an income. If they have an income, uh, they can't help their children. That means someday we don't want, we don't have to help those orphans. Those, her, those orphans can uh, stay with their moms, they can have a good life. That's the aim, uh, having uh, the both ministry. And until then, we are helping the orphans, uh, and we call it home-based. We put the, the children in a family to help them to raise with, with family, to have someone uh, to love them, to, what do you call, to raise them, uh, to give them a good a good character, just uh, somebody somebody is there to to guide them. Uh, because of that, we see a lot of good results in their life. The children they are not orphans really. When you see them, they are they are different. They have a good character. They are doing their schooling. It's it's amazing. It's amazing. It's there is hope. There is hope. Um, I always say, I'm not raising an orphan. I'm raising the leaders of tomorrow. 
because I am giving them my love, my Jesus. Because of the Art Life Center, we are raising leaders, even the widows. Now they have hope. They are seeing change for the first time in their life. We, we tell them they are not poor in nature. No, this is opportunity. They have to get up and do something. They are able. Now they are believing in themselves. And they are doing an amazing job. Really. It's good. It's so encouraging. Just to do more. And, and these micro loans that you're giving, how quickly are they paying these back? Uh, they pay back in the, the, the amount of the loan is different. Uh, it's depending with their project. Uh, they have a two year period, but they, they pay quick. In eight months, in 10 months, in one year, they pay off. They pay back. So they're able to get on their feet to yes. where they can support yeah. a family. Yes. Yeah. That quickly, and then yes. the, that money gets reinvested in that next oh, family. Yes. yes. Which is Truth. just Truth. Yeah. yeah. It's it's yeah. so yeah. much more than just yes. oh I fed a child that I know mm -hmm. we're, yeah. we're changing a child's trajectory yes. for yes. the rest of their life. The yeah. money rolls down to others. Yeah. Some of them they want they come and uh, tell us to give them more money so yes. that they will diversify. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and round two, round three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We call it that three. way. I mean, yeah. it's amazing when you see uh, a few years ago a, a woman with children but having nothing, practically nothing to eat uh, with HIV, maybe victims, some of them, and so on. And now you see them getting up mm -hmm. and uh, self-sustained. Yes. And not only that, uh, there is a lady I remember who sends her, her daughter to university now paying by herself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. It's it's really a joy. Our system is a little bit different from the normal uh, way of this orphanage system. The orphanage system is a system that brings children, orphans, into one place, right. having a dormitory and so yeah. on. We don't follow that because that's disastrous. We, we found out that that is disastrous for the children. The children grew up like that most of the times became gang leaders again, go to the streets and just. So we say this one, as, as Mulu said earlier, home-based and community integrated. Why home-based is we put the children with families. Why community integrated is they, 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 they are going to grow up with the community, within the village, yes. with other children, going public schools just like other children, a normal way of life with, yeah. uh, with love from the family. It's so amazing, guys, and thank you, thank you for just not giving up. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, I, I tell my staff that it's usually every week I'm ready to quit, mm -hmm. and it's usually over something stupid, um, and just, it's a blessing to me, it's going to be a blessing to so many others, just to to hear what you've been through and how Jesus has been that hope that, yeah. that's kept the dream alive, that could have died anywhere along the path. Yes. Yes. And then also how it re reunited you. Yes. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank, thank you very you. much for you too, you. taking your time yes. uh, doing this for, for, for us and also for God, of course, for the kingdom. You are in a, in a wonderful job. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> yes. Wonderful calling. So. Oh. Well, all right. Well, thank yeah. you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. So, hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Every Archangel Podcast. I know it was a little different, but this is a story I think that's worth sharing. There's so many of us, and I was one of them. We go out there and we chase after a dream, and we think we know what we're supposed to do. But in the end, Jesus shows up and he shows us a better way. And so all that persecution, all those things that you might be going through in your life, don't take them as not. Jesus loves you. He's got a perfect plan for you. And when you put him at the center of it all, things start to change. Miracles start to happen. Families start to be reunited. And most of all, you get to chase after your God-given dream.